Hey everybody, welcome to Profiling Evil with Mike King. I'm here with Chris McDonough. Chris, thanks so much again for taking time this morning. Uh, we're we're going to be talking a little bit today about the Vallow case, particularly mm -hmm. Alexander Cox and the murder of uh, Charles Vallow. Uh, why don't you kind of tee us up for what's going on on this one? This video, this officer body camera video, gives us real evidence because this is as it goes down, he's walking into this house. And I think uh, Mike and I have a few questions here. And, and we've also caught some observations that we want to share with you. So let's, let's go into the mind of the officer through the body camera, walking into the scene where this uh, victim is. Yeah, and I think it's kind of interesting, Chris, when you think about what we're seeing, what the officer is experiencing um, folks sometimes get a little critical of why didn't the officer do this or why didn't they do that? Well, there, there's a couple of things that are going on in the officer's mind right now. First and foremost is securing that scene and doing it safely for himself. He, he wants to go home to his family too. And so as he walks into that home, he's trying to, to assess and gather as much information as he possibly can and still maintain the proper amount of uh, concealment cover for himself as he moves through this residence. And then when he uh, sees the body of Charles, he, uh, while still having to protect himself, he needs to get over there and see if there is a uh, need to go for life-saving measures too. So th there's a lot of stuff happening in your mind when you're walking through these houses on something yeah, like this. Sure is. It's going a thousand miles an hour and your adrenaline is high. And I want everybody to pay attention real closely to how calm this officer's voice is as he's going through this. This isn't his first major crime. And uh, it's really awesome to watch his control and his capability. And, and we can always find things on the Monday morning to quarterback challenge on, but uh, this, this is pretty remarkable. But one thing that you and I noticed right off the bat is as he's starting to enter the home, off the bat. Good one, Mike. Evidence. Off the bat. You said off the <laughs> oh, bat. There we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> That's where the Freudian slip. <laughs> so, so, folks, you might notice there's a, an article of clothing. We don't know what this is. At the bottom of these steps leading into the, into the living area of this house are a pair of shoes as well. And then, of course, this piece of clothing. Now, keep in mind the dialogue that's going on because... Uh, the dialogue is that uh, this is a hostile, aggressive man moving through this house. I don't know how many times I went to a bar fight or something, but never did I remove my duty boots when I walked through the door of a bar fight. Yeah. Um, if, if this guy's going to a fight, I find that really intriguing that uh, he would remove his shoes if, in fact, that's when that happened or is what happened. But you then remember, this article of clothing, yeah, go ahead, Chris. No, remember we used to call that DLR, right? Does not look right. Okay. <laughs> you know, so he, this guy, this officer, to your point, I mean, he's in an officer safety tactical mode initially because, you know, all the information that he's got, he still has to communicate to tell everybody what he's doing. Okay. And yeah, to your point, he walks in and boom, there's the shoes. And there's this piece of whatever this article is, um, it DLR, it does not look right. It's just sitting over there going, you know. Yeah. And don't you think that's kind of wonking out the officer too, that this house is is basically vacant of, of furniture and other things. And yet people yeah. are saying we we live there. But yeah, let's let's kind of follow him for a second here. Okay. Chandler, please vote in. Anybody inside make some noise? And he pauses there for officer safety. He's evaluating point. the totality of the room because he doesn't know if, how many guns there are. Is there somebody else or what else is going on down that hallway? But he sees a guy. But go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry, Mike. Yeah, no, no, that's right on. So so the, the image is blurred and gratefully it is because we don't need to see that kind of stuff. But what we are seeing here is something that's really intriguing uh, that caught yours and my attention. And, and that is just the, the posture that this individual is on on the ground. If uh, we know that this was a violent assault, we know that the caliber of the weapon from what's been reported was 
was high. I mean, these are these are heavy duty rounds that were hitting this suspect, and they were hitting him, or this suspect. I apologize, this this individual, and they were hitting him center mass. I mean, right here in, in the chest, from what reports are. Uh, when you look at this body, uh, this wasn't somebody that fell down on the ground and curled up in a ball and writhed around. Uh, I would suspect he probably was was dead the moment he hit the floor. And what are the things that kind of tell us those and th that, Chris? Uh, you know, there's a couple of things. I mean, one, it, well, for, first of all, let, let's take a look at his at, at his feet. Okay, I think Mike, you brought up a great point. You know, is he wearing socks? To, is you know, is he wearing shoes? Are those his shoes? Right, because this is the first initial, you know observation of the officer coming through the door. He looks down, there's a set of shoes. He looks over the DLR and then he looks to his right and he sees this guy laying there, but he's laying there just kind of propped out. Okay. Yeah. As if, you know, well, that looks weird. Okay. And I think you and I, through our experience, I mean, if you look over, and you see this, the first thing you're going to start doing is looking around to see what kind of you know threats are around you. And he makes a first observation of seeing the body in this position. We, we can go back to that in a second, but you caught, um, if we roll the video forward here just for a second, you caught the, 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 the bat, this, this infamous bat that everybody's been talking about uh, sitting up uh, on the right above to the, so it's, to, this bat now would be to the right of the officer. Okay. And let, and, and yeah. uh, so, you so know, let's talk bad. about that. If the, if the victim is laying on the ground, I'm going to try to give him the, the image yeah. here a little, little better. Yeah. Um, if the victim is laying on the ground and his arms are down at the side, uh, the interesting thing is the bat handle is up at the top of Valo's head and the bat head uh, is further toward the door that we just entered in from. And so it's really interesting because the motion in your mind to uh, have that bat facing that direction, when Valo's hands are down to his side, you would think if he's holding that bat to his side in a threatening manner, uh, and the way he dropped, that that bat would have been facing with the head down the hallway, not opposite which could support Cox's claim that he was, you know, getting ready to take a swing at the plate and yeah, but, uh, then drops. But how does his hand get forward? Yeah. And that's a great point because we have some, some conflicting statement information, right? And, and everybody's heard it. Hey, you know, is he holding the bat like this? Is he holding the bat like that? Well, you know, the first question we need to identify is, is he right-handed or is he left-handed? And we could go back through his baseball cards to find that out, right? Is he, is he a right-hand batter or is he a left-hand batter? Okay. And then we have to also discover, well, what about Alex? Is he right-handed or left-handed? Because that's going to become significant uh, pretty soon here. Okay. And so now, even if he's doing this or if he's doing this or if he's doing this, okay, you, we have to say to ourselves, okay, boom, 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 boom. Okay. and he falls or does he collapse? You know, we've seen it in every different direction. Does the bat hit the wall? Okay. But if you look at that bat, it's just kind of laying up against that wall over there. And, yeah. and the crime scene sketch would be, is going to be really interesting to see what the measurement is. And, you know, there, sometimes you can get, uh, you can do some reverse engineering by going to an engineer and recreating you know, how that bat got into that position. And then you have to, re you can recreate, how did the body get into that position? So there's a lot of unknowns yet that I think uh, our crime fighters are gonna be uh, pretty excited to maybe, you know, dive into here, but you, you nailed it. No, <laughs> no, Chris. And the other thing that kind of, I find interesting before we move back, cause I want you to talk about uh, the bat a little bit, but, <clears throat> But again, we have him laying here um, by looking as closely as we could. And, and folks, you can go on and, and find the video and, and look more closely if you want to look at the body more closely. Uh, again, we're not going to explore that here other than to suggest that 
it appears that there's a small pool of blood forming over the left shoulder, which would be consistent with um, a, a trauma wound to the chest. And it's a pretty small amount of blood. Keep in mind that if, if this guy is alive and his heart's still pumping and he has multiple rounds to the chest from a large caliber weapon, there's going to be a lot of uh, blood, especially if Cox performs CPR like he later testifies that he does, which I find interesting, Chris, uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that that arm is still awfully close to the body if someone were snuggled up against uh, Valo and performing CPR. I wonder if that arm would have been pushed up further or closer to the body, not where you'd have to straddle it or, and again, that's just conjecture and theorizing. But there was also something that really bothered us about the amount of blood that would happen if you were performing CPR. And what was so significant about that to us? Well, I mean, the chest compressions, obviously, when when the body stuff, when the heart stops, the blood will settle uh, immediately. So, but you would have the initial uh, you know, bleed if he's kind of standing there for a second when he gets hit. Remember, you know, it's not the movies, you know, people don't fly through the door and, you know, et cetera. Sometimes people can actually stand there, boom, 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 and they can actually just stand there for a second till the ticker stops and then they just can kind of drop, okay? But typically you don't see them dropping like this. In fact, the, this is really one of the first times I've seen somebody you know, drop like this with four, you know, with some rounds to the chest. And it's also important to when you watch the paramedics, they're not moving the body, i.e. they're working CPR on him, but they're not touching those arms. Okay. This is what they see when they get in there and they, they, they do an initial assessment. But one of the things that we want to point out pretty quickly here is a couple of things. One, the bat itself. Okay. Let's talk about the mindset of, um, you know, Charles. Hey, you know, um, Go ahead. before we do that, I want to just hit on one point, too. And I think even some of our listeners have have questioned this is um, the fact that if you're doing CPR on someone with massive chest wounds, uh, you're going to have blood on you. And you have blood on your hands, any, for sure. You know, I haven't seen evidence of that on uh, Alex when he's at the curb. So he's either had an opportunity to clean up and prepare or um, or he's some miraculous way it didn't happen. Uh, but but I found that really intriguing and, and something that's worth exploring a little further. But but anyway, yeah. I wanted to just throw that out and, and mention that before we move on to the back, because this was, to me, a really huge thing that was picked up. So let's go back to the uh, video clip okay. and, uh, and explore uh, what's going on here. So uh, we're looking at over the left ear of the police officer, at the bat talk about that bat for a second well so there's a couple of things right i think you know mike nailed the we've got we've got the looks like we've got the bat uh we've got the brand here um and the most interesting thing is um, what type of bat is it uh, in relationship to the mindset of alex ty lee you know jj etc it looks like it's a, a Rawlings uh, youth bat that you can buy at any sporting goods store anywhere. So that's one of the first things. Um, and to Mike's point a minute ago about the blood on the hands and stuff, we're, we still don't know if they do what they call a um, GSR, gunshot residue. Uh, it's a couple of swabs you hit on the hands if somebody's fired a weapon because all the the uh, powder will come back. So they may have swabbed, uh, you know, not only Alex, but hopefully Lori. Okay. That will be very interesting. We'll tell you why in a couple of minutes, but uh, on actually on the next video. Um, so here you are, you got a youth bat and now you have to say, okay, who owns this bat? Right. We, we hear the stories. It's Tylee's bat. Uh, but could it be JJ's bat? Okay. Um, could it be Alex's bat? Could it be, you know, it's doubtful it's Charles' bat. bat, unless he's keeping it there for the kids, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Could it be Charles' bat? 
Okay? So we've got four bat people, potentially, that own this thing. Okay? Uh, so let's break it down into a mindset of who selects a youth 11-year-old bat, potentially. <clears throat> Mike, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, uh, certainly a father would select a bat like that for their children, so that we have to continue to think about that and think that the bat originates. But again, this house is pretty empty, and he's coming to pick up his kids. Um, the fact that he might be bringing a bat to an eventual gunfight is pretty unlikely. Now, there's testimony that would suggest that Ty Lee had the bat and came out and was prodding Charles because he and her mother uh, are fighting. <clears throat> Man, certainly possible and, and maybe even probable that that's how the bat ends up on the scene. But others have, have conjectured that uh, it's JJ's bat. And I thought you found something really intriguing about that as we move on. But I, so that's where I'd go right now. Yeah. And we also, let's not forget the cell phone that Lori has. And she also ends up with his keys, right? So if he's got the cell phone, okay, and at some point the cell phone is dropped or whatever. But the problem that Lori has right now is she says that she ends up with the cell phone. And there's kind of this disturbance that kicks this whole thing off over the cell phone. So he comes in, right, maybe, takes his shoes off, okay, and somehow Lori gets his cell phone. That's still kind of a question. It's, you know, there's, she says, yeah, it was sitting on the table, but okay, well, then is he there eating? Is he hanging out? What's going on here? Okay. And so the cell phone is a mystery, and we'll, we'll tap into that in a little bit. Uh, however, let's look at the mindset of who potentially could own this bat. And so as the officer moves forward here into the room, we see some interesting stuff. Okay, hold on and freeze. Buzz Lightyear to the rescue. Okay. Yeah, well, who does that belong to? That's JJ. That's JJ in the room i.e. meaning in the house. Okay? That's his mindset. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is a developmentally challenged child. Yeah. Um, it, it seems much more likely that it's JJ's than Ty Lee's. Yep. Um, could it be a visiting neighbor? I guess, but I've not seen anything, the evidence to suggest that. So, yeah, I think you're spot on. And, and then as we keep moving, Mike, I think we get additional evidence of JJ's presence. Right there. That looks like a doll of some sort, uh, you know, for uh, uh, a child, you know, who would have the mental capacity uh, of JJ on the autism spectrum. And, you know, a young man who, you know, is, 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 is challenged and making the best and doing the best under medication, et cetera. But we also have information that he's, you know, may and may not be on his medication. So uh, these are the kind of, you know, um, comforting type of toys that will lower that stress level for him and put him into that fantasy world as a, as a young boy to kind of, you know, you know, disassociate with all of the, the craziness in this world. Um, so I think he's witnessing that family. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think these are, you know, two huge clues here as to asking the question, okay, well, is it JJ's bat? Okay. Well, I, I'm not sure yet. I'm not convinced personally. Okay. But I'm going to go, you know, again, we said, you know, hundred dollars on bingo card for Chandler. Okay. Um, I think we now get, uh, Ty Lee who plays into the picture of saying, no, it was my bat. Okay. And she introduces this bat into the argument taking place out in the big room uh, with the parents over the phone. Okay. And probably, you know, some of the other Mishikos that Lori's presenting into this case. Okay. And then you have Alex in the back bedroom who decides to intervene. And um, I, I think, Mike, as we go forward here, there's a couple of things we want to ask our, our viewers, right, that we were talking about. 
you may have information about uh, whether or not he's wearing shoes, you know, in terms of in that maybe there's reports out there that we haven't found yet. That'd be very interesting because that will help us explain some of the things that we're seeing on this video. Um, and also, um, do, are there any evidence anywhere in the stores uh, around the local area uh, where that bat could have been purchased? And maybe, uh, you know, maybe we could put it into whoever's paying for its hands um, because it, you know, we'll see. I mean, That'd be really interesting, actually, if some of our uh, listeners could uh, look at the stores that are close by and look on their online and see if they have those bats in stock, see if it happened to uh, originate or could have originated from a store nearby. And boy, wouldn't that be a golden nugget if you had uh, one of one of these wacky players uh, purchasing that the day before? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's job security. Out. If they got him on video or whoever, right? I mean, it's yeah. like you know, we used to love that. Remember, you get the phone call and say, "Dude, I'm down here at the so and so such and such. He's, you know, they're on video." <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm I'm wondering too, Chris, if there uh, could be a transference of gunshot residue from the hand to the bat, if in fact it was uh, put there as part of of a staging. That's a great and, point. Absolutely. Mike. I don't know if they process that bat for uh, any kind of GSR, but that would be really interesting. The other thing that, that we would point. love is to have you kind of dig a little bit, see if you can figure out what that article of clothing is. Does it matter? Probably not. Uh, but for some reason, it was thrown in the corner. Now, when we get into the bedrooms in uh, our next video and look at some of the things in the bedrooms, some of them are an absolute disaster zone as far as clothing thrown here and there. But it's so interesting because when you get to um, Alex's bedroom, it's a different story. Everything is, uh, it would be interesting to know if Alex lives the way his room looks uh, on this video. But we're going we're gonna to explore that next, right? Yep, we're going to explore that next and we're going to do a deeper dive. And so, um, you know, we're, th this is fun, guys. Uh, we're grateful that you're on our team. And uh you know, we're learning from you a lot, you know, like we keep, you know, talking about it's a crime, plunder, Tyson, all you folks, all of, everybody in the true crime community out here. Um, one thing that Mike and I were talking about, um, and then I'll um, stop here is, you know, crimes are solved by citizens. Uh, whether we, we, we realize it or not, it's you out there that are providing the police with the the clues or the tips that really put that case to another level. So keep it up, crime fighters. Uh, we're grateful that you're part of uh, the PE family here and uh, your, your many profilers. Hopefully you're becoming great profilers as uh, Mike, you know, teaches us all, you know, as we go forward. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button. But the next video, you're not going to want to miss it because we've got some pretty good stuff. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks a lot, Chris. Folks, thank you. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for telling and inviting your friends to come and give us a try as well. We're growing. We're almost at 8,000 today. That's pretty Let's remarkable. Let's hit 10,000 by, by next week. What do you think? You think that, we can that do that? Would be so wonderful. If you could help us, uh, that's great. It just gives us the ability to share more content uh, and, uh, and your support and your donations have been uh, deeply appreciated so please uh, continue to consider how you can you can help us as we try to roll out content that is valuable we got a shout out to circa three and thank them for helping us with the product production each time and uh, and again to thank each of you so until we uh chat again we hope that you'll all be safe and you know this case is a perfect time to remind you of something that i've said in the past chris and that is uh if you are ever feeling threatened or you know somebody who's th being threatened, you need to get to a place of safety immediately. And then you need to reach out to your local law enforcement agency, your medical or your mental health provider, get the help. It will not get better on its own. And to, to, uh, to lie to yourself that somehow it's gonna get better just doesn't seem to happen. 
get the help and get out and get safe. And if you have little ones that are being subjected to any kind of abuse or, um, or destructive kinds of environments, get them out and get them safe. They deserve to have a happy, safe life. And to each of you and to my good friend, Chris, thank you so much for all you do. I hope you have a good day. And Chris, thanks again, brother. Um, you got a hurricane coming your way. And yeah. uh, we, we may uh, be talking to you from a hotel room when we visit again. But uh, to you and your family, the very best as you, uh, as you deal with that. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate you guys. Aloha.